to the Future of Resolution, Miles Mediation and Arbitration's podcast. On today's episode, we have General Counsel of Cox Automotive, Angus Haig. Cox Automotive is an Atlanta-based business unit of Cox Enterprises, formed in 2014 to consolidate all of Cox's global automotive businesses, including Kelly Blue Book, Autotrader.com, and Mannheim. Angus is interviewed by Miles Neutral's Nigel Wright and Jennifer Greppa. Angus, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Uh, we wanted to talk about your background and how you became GC at Cox Automotive and very much appreciate you uh, agreeing to sit down and answer some questions. My pleasure. It's nice to be here. So, Angus, I just wondered if you would kindly uh, provide us with a little bit of background about how you ended up as general counsel of Cox. Well, um, really a, a, a pretty long story um, starting back in, I suppose, 1993-94 when I uh, finished law school uh, in Australia. I was... Um, I was lucky enough to become an associate to a Supreme Court judge in the, the Supreme Court of South Australia. And so I spent a, a year uh, under his tutelage, uh, helping him write judgments and as his assistant at the court. So we do both commercial and criminal. Uh, after that, I, um, I moved into um, personal injury uh, litigation, working for the insurance companies on um, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, defending the defending the, insur- the, uh, the state government insurance um, uh, company, uh, in addition to workers' comp claims uh, for workers' comp uh, for the government, as well as uh, prosecuting actually some workers' comp fraud, which was rather interesting. So um, after that, um, I re- my, my passion really was to become um, part of a commercial and corporate law firm. So I had um, a summer clerkship at one of the larger firms in, in Adelaide in South Australia. And um, they called me whilst I was uh, whilst I was doing the personal injury work and said, would you be interested in coming over? And I said, absolutely. So uh, I went, I moved to Minter Ellison in Adelaide and spent um, probably a, a year or two learning the craft of drafting from a couple of uh, wonderful, uh, well-seasoned lawyers and um, learning, you know, just my way around contracts and uh, and really fine-tuning my commercial skills. Then uh, in, uh, I think it was around about 1997, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, who was working in the radio industry and the marketing promotion side of things, she was, uh, she was lucky enough to get a transfer to Sydney. And so um, she moved, I followed, and um, I moved to a medium, now large size firm called Gaydens, based in Sydney. I, uh, I was doing corporate and commercial work there. Uh, I was doing some sports, marketing, uh, and uh, sporting events type work, lots of lots of terms and conditions, hotel agreements, mining joint ventures out of Papua New Guinea, all sorts of unusual things um, and some liquor licensing and those sorts of things. And after a period of time, I worked out that the culture of the firm really wasn't a good fit for me. So I'd always wanted to go and work in a business and being part of a, a, a sort of on the commercial side. So I started looking around for... Um, looking around for in-house roles because it was, you know, I'd been about five years out and it was a really good time to to move into in-house. I uh, interviewed for a number of roles. I answered an advertisement which was unbranded and had the the, the interview and the interviewer said to me, "Um, have you got any idea um, what the job is? And I said, have no idea and I don't know who it's for. And they said, well, actually it's um, for Coca-Cola. And um, it's as their marketing council for the South Pacific, which would be Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia uh, and the Pacific Islands. And I said, my dream job, come true. And uh, I went through a successive six or seven interviews over three months and I finally got the job. So that's, uh, that then started me um, on a trajectory uh, with Coca-Cola moving around the world. Can you tell us more about your different roles as you escalated through Coke? Absolutely, absolutely. There? I started as the marketing counsel for the, the South Pacific Division 
um, I was lucky enough to – that was in 1998. And um, so Coca-Cola being one of the major sponsors of the Olympics – I was uh, tasked with getting um, the Sydney side of things up and running. So the risk management side of things, the insurance side of things, initial contracts, leases for space and all those sorts of things. Um, Jackie, my wife, was actually also uh, working on the Olympics but uh, in, on the agency side then with uh, looking after Speedo. So we basically had no sleep for six months over the Olympic sort of period, even though it was a six-week period, and um, and so after a successful um, after a successful uh, Olympics, um, then everything sort of started to wind down, and I started to sort of have conversations with the general counsel, or who was the he was actually the, I think the Asia Pacific general counsel at that time, uh, Jeff Kelly, uh, who then ultimately became the general counsel of Coca Cola Company. Um, Jeff and I discussed about me coming to Atlanta uh, around about 2001. And um, what happened was that uh, the Coca-Cola company had went through a reduction in force at that time and I think five, seven and a half thousand people were um, leaving the company at the time. So he said to me, look, I'm sorry, I know we discussed this before but it really it really uh, isn't a good time and there are other people that we need to keep within the function. And I said, that's fine, no problems. So uh, a couple of months later, my then boss, uh, the division council in, um, in Sydney, came to me and said, um, there's a lawyer based in Beijing and he uh, would like to come down here and get some experience in Australia. And she said, I said, that's well, okay, that's great. She said, um, well, and we'd like to do an exchange. So you would go to China wow. and he would come here. Okay. So basically we were swapping roles. And um, so he came down from Beijing and I went to Shanghai, which was their head office, for I think it was five months. And, um, and Jackie was pregnant with our first child. She stayed back in Australia for several months finishing up her role and then she came to China and we sort of spent the rest of uh, our time uh, in China uh, together until we came back, uh, which would have been at the end of uh, around about 2001-2. I came back, uh, went back into my uh, marketing council role for the, the, the South Pacific group or, or, or division and, um, and then I, I was involved in a global transaction. Uh, the global transaction involved uh, Village Roadshow, which is the cinema chain and movie producer. And their head office is in Melbourne, but it was a global contract. So they needed a, an Australian lawyer to be on the other side of uh, the negotiations with Village Roadshow. So that then uh, introduced me to having to interact with all of the council around the rest of the world in the 20-something countries where Village Roadshow uh, had cinemas and screens and where we were going to enter into a marketing partnership for the Coca-Cola company beverages and products. And so um, after a successful completion, after many months of uh, heavy negotiations, um, uh, I, I'd obviously got to know the International Council uh, pretty well. I, uh, I was then approached by uh, Peter Turcott, who was the group council uh, for Europe based in Madrid. And um, he actually, we were, on, we were at another meeting. Uh, we were actually in Tokyo at the time talking about FIFA and, and, and Olympics and all those sort of things. And he said, look, um, would you be interested in coming to Europe? And uh, we need a new uh, European customer council and marketing council because the current person at that time was moving into a specialty role uh, as the uh, European uh, Competition Law Council. And so within the space of uh, six months, um, we'd uh, moved back from China, went back into my other role, we had our first child and... Uh, then moved to um, to London within the space of six months uh, with a, with a five-month-year-old. Um, 
And so then uh, I spent probably two and a half, almost three years working out of uh, the London office uh, as the uh, marketing council for Europe, Eurasia and the Middle East. Again, working a lot with um, the various uh, uh, business unit and region council all throughout Europe. I was doing um, large customer contracts uh, with our European uh, customers, so Shell um, and a lot of the petroleum companies um, um, and a lot of the um, uh, like Carrefour, uh, the supermarket chains and those sorts of things. So that took me around um, Europe and introduced me to a, to a lot of uh, uh, interesting people around Europe and, and on the customer side. Well, how did you make it to the States? Um, after working on both the European uh, Union and also on the global customer contracts because one of the reasons for working on the global customer contracts was that uh, the company was under uh, investigation by the European Commission in various countries throughout the, throughout the European Union. And so they wanted someone who was sensitised to those, that situation to be also involved in the global contracts. Now, was that an Article 81 inquiry? It, uh, it was um, sort of a, a tying, misleading and deceptive uh, type of uh, investigation throughout uh, GB, Ireland, Germany, Spain, Portugal, I think, uh, and France. Anyway, so uh, long story short, after two and a half years uh, in London uh, and a second child, we moved back to Sydney. The then uh, division council who I had started working for back in 1998, she left the company and they were very uh, keen to have uh, an Australian lawyer back in that role that, that was had some experience with the company. Um, and so the division president down there... Uh, and the group council at the time in Europe uh, asked me to go back down to Sydney. They had expanded the territory for uh, the South Pacific Division, adding Korea to it as well, which bo- lined up with our, our bottling company that, uh, that uh, the franchise that was based out of uh, Seoul, Korea. I, uh, I did that for around about almost two years. Um, and uh, had a small team. I had lawyers based in uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, uh, and a couple of paralegals. Um, and uh, and basically, it was in, I was really just a general counsel of the South Pacific Division, working on all things from uh, transactions to competition law issues to contracts to IP trademarks, whatever it might be, whatever came through the door, employment issues, and. Um, I'd actually been involved in uh, a global uh, team that had um, restructured the legal organisation a year or so before. And through that uh, involvement um, and through uh, through the participation that I had in that, I got exposure to others in the US who were also on that team. I obviously made a reasonably good impression. Uh, because they called me up in Sydney and said, we have uh, an opening here in, uh, here in Atlanta. It is uh, as the, uh, the, the marketing council uh, across both uh, corporate and North, North America and um, we would like to know if you're interested. And uh, to their surprise, I said, absolutely, I'm interested. Um, and um, I always thought once we'd gone back to Australia... In, uh, in around about uh, 2005, 2006, that our run of overseas postings had ended. Uh, but that's not quite, quite the truth. Um, so in 2006, I was travelling back and forth from Atlanta uh, to, um, to Sydney, sort of doing two jobs, uh, the General Counsel for South Pacific and also started the marketing role. Jackie, my wife, was pregnant with our third child and I managed to get back for the birth and um, we ended up uh, selling the house we just renovated and, um, and then um, packing up and moving in January 2007 to the States. And I, I, um, I came over to uh, head office here in Atlanta, um, merged two legal teams of about 30 professionals on each side, on the corporate side and on the um, North American side. So... We were uh, in, in charge of all of the uh, the global properties and the North American sports and marketing properties, knowledge, insights uh, and intellectual property side of things. 
and um, uh, after two years, after having successfully combined those two teams and, and um, reorganising it, there was a restructure on the North American side and they decided that they wanted – they didn't want their legal counsel being distracted by corporate matters because what I'd done is I'd given everybody a variety of both international corporate matters and North American matters to sort of give them an experience on both sides. So uh, we – we subdivided the team again. I moved fully over onto the corporate side. I inherited another group, uh, which was uh, licensing, uh, licensed merchandise and stores. So everywhere where you see any branded Coca-Cola products, for example, the one that's sitting there in front of me, they, uh, that, that company would pay a license fee in certain percentages to the company for the use of the brand. So that was one of the areas. I um, And then over a period of time, uh, the role uh, between 2007 and 2013 was um, was expanded. So we add, uh, I was added uh, the areas of environment uh, and sustainability, uh, technical and regulatory, uh, as well as the worldwide licensing and as well as global marketing. So I had four or five areas with a larger team. And um, and then we got to a point in 2013, we'd been in the States for probably six, seven years. It was sort of time to look at, well, what's next? And um, what was arranged was that the Asia Pacific Group Council or General Council, who was based in Shanghai at the time, would come to Atlanta and that I would then relocate to Tokyo. And so uh, in 2013, I was appointed as the uh, general counsel, international general counsel for Asia Pacific, overseeing uh, five divisions and, and 33 countries. I, um, I left the family here. We'd had our fourth child by that time and we'd, we decided to stop. And, um, and I commuted back and forth from Tokyo uh, for about seven or eight months uh, during which uh, the children finished their education, the, the education year in 2014. And then in uh, mid-2014, the family, uh, we all reun reunited back in Tokyo. So I spent uh, almost, I suppose, two and a half, three years as the Asia Pacific General Counsel uh, based out of Tokyo. Um, I also was given a second role, which was just was the division counsel for the local Japanese business unit as well. So it was sort of a, a dual role of a group role as well as a local division role. Um, the, the, the thing that drove us to come back and we came back sort of uh, mid-2016 was really the education for the four children and we knew that the education here in the US, particularly in Atlanta, was exceptional and the children weren't really getting exactly what they needed. Um, so for really for family reasons and, um, you know, uh, we decided to move back to Atlanta. That prompted um, trying to work out what the next thing was. Um, after almost 19 years, um, I made a decision to um, to leave the company and then look for another role. I didn't have a role to go to. I just thought, well, um, I'll, I'll finish up with Coke. I'll look for the next role. And um, so over the next 11, 12 months, I searched for this role. Uh, I spent uh, a few months dabbling in commercial real estate and some consulting and uh, getting involved in uh, some non-profit boards. I, uh, I, I was on, on the school board uh, and I've since joined the, uh, the board of the International Dyslexia Association um, and so sort of put my efforts into that and also finding a job. So I started here um, in very early April of 2018, so it's not, not quite two years. Um, so that's really, in a very, very long way, how I ended up here in this chair. Nice. That's a, a, a wonderful <laughs> explanation and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, just a couple of things I thought I kind of picked up on. First of all, uh, Minter Ellison, which is the firm you first started yes. with, I actually know them fairly well. I yes. used to work with them when I was uh, based out of London. Uh, and they were always a very international focused firm. Absolutely. And I just wonder whether that helped you as you were looking... Uh, down the line for where you might end up? I, th I think that, yes, they're very international, um, uh, but I think at that time I was uh, I was still really focused on 
um, being a lawyer in a in I suppose a national practice, but I suppose the the natural inclination uh, for Australians is travel, and ex- exploration and adventure, and so um, I'd always t- I wanted to to work and move overseas, and uh, I suppose Coca Cola. I, I, I must admit, I, I could not in my wildest dreams have have sort of predicted or planned the career I've had, and I, I, I'm incredibly lucky. I really am. So, but Minters, uh, and particularly the three partners that I worked with there, really gave me an exceptional basis and grounding in in commercial law and uh, the art of drafting contracts. So that, that, that really gave me a, a good start. I don't know if I shared this with you, but I actually lived in Australia for a year. Yeah, yep, you did. In Sydney did. and then up, uh, up on the Gold Coast. Everyone says, and I'm sure you had the same uh, reaction, why would you ever want to leave? And um, I, I suppose the reaction for me is, look, it's an absolutely wonderful, amazing place to live and grow up, um, but there is a big wide world out there and so, um, you know, if, you, if you're keen, I'd go out and adventure and it's always a great place to go back to. But I think that's one of the advantages of having come from someone like Australia and having worked in the Asia-Pacific arena is that you're used to travel and you have a broader horizon than maybe many of the GCs who live and, and work in North America and don't have that international exposure. As the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Cox Automotive, can you tell some of our listeners about your day-to-day here at Cox, what kind of things that you're responsible for, what kind of teams you're supervising? Sure, sure. We um, We have here in the U.S. a team of around about 30 people. Most of them are lawyers, um, about... 20 of those are based here in Atlanta. We have others uh, based in Carmel. We have them based in California. Uh, We have them, um, one person based out of Nashville. Uh, We have uh, another, a couple of people based out of Burlington, Vermont. So um, it's a little bit of a a virtual team at times, which I'm very much used to. we also have uh, lawyers based out of uh, Melbourne uh, who look after Australian and New Zealand. So we have two wonderful lawyers down there. We have two wonderful lawyers based out of Ontario in Canada um, looking after the Canadian business. And we also have uh, two or three lawyers based uh, in Leeds in the UK um, as part of our auction business over there. Angus, one of the things I found interesting looking uh, at Cox Automotive was uh, that it seemed to be as much of an IP technology company as it was a car company or automotive company. Is that something that you sense given your contractual dealings with the parties or is it still very much based upon the physical car as opposed to the services? Very much going digital. Uh, software, uh, technology, um issues of privacy, um, issues of just um, looking forward to the future. Uh, and th- that's what I really love about this this company. And when I was doing the research on the company, I looked at uh, the rest of Cox and where it started over 120 years ago. They started in the newspaper business. Then they went to the radio. Then they went to television. Then they went to cable. Then they went to internet service provider. Then in the late 60s, I think 69, 70, they bought Mannheim auctions. And so they got into the physical car auction space. And if you run that all the way through now, um, they're in uh, dealer software. Uh, they are, we are getting into the fleet mobility space. So, so for example, we have a, a centre down by the airport here in Atlanta. We've converted to a... Uh, a sort of a, a service centre for lift uh, vehicles. So the drivers can come in there, they use the lounge, and they, at the same time as they, they take a rest, they can actually have um, their their tyres changed, their oil changed, their vehicles serviced. They can all also lease a vehicle on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis from there, and uh, there's also ele- uh, electric vehicles down there for them to lease on short term. There's charging stations, and they get the benefit of um, fleet pricing, but they're individuals who are drivers. So we are getting very much even more so into the technology space, 
whether it be um, software solutions, whether it be um, uh, or, yeah, very, very, very much technologically focused. And I think that um, if you if you look at uh, Cox Automotive itself, it's actually brought together in 2014 over 20 brands together. So you have all sorts of um, all sorts of different parts of it. So you've got mobility fleet solutions is one big area. Um, physical auctions is another area. And then our digital auctions are now just tipped over into 50% of our sales uh, on the auction side of, uh, side of things. We, um, we've, we're also into, um, we own uh, Auto Trader, uh, Kelly Blue Book. So data is, is the, new, uh, the, the new currency these days. So that's something that's very mindful. So given your uh, love of recent Porsches, what made you interested <laughs> in Cox Automotive? Well, um, it's, it's funny. It's, uh, Cox Automotive is more, uh, it's more a, a technology, IT, uh, software, solutions company than actually a car company. Um, but, um, but I suppose um, having an interest in cars... Um, gives you a little bit of background in relation to it. Uh, we, we, we support and we service uh, around about 25, 30,000 dealers around the US. And um, so I, I, I'm very interested in the dealer side of things, how car businesses work. And we also look after the OEMs, the, all the original uh, equipment manufacturers as well. So we, we have uh, business with all of the majors, uh, we have all of the OEMs. You've described how Cox has innovated over the course of its lifetime. Yep. And how it's always on the, the mm -hmm. front mm -hmm. of the market. Absolutely. And do you have any premonitions about what's to come? Would, what will the company be on the forefront of as we embark on the next decade? We've already started there. We are uh, looking at and investing in um, becoming an expert in battery technology. Um, we are, um, Cox Enterprises has invested into two gaming teams. So gaming online or people watching gaming online is, is bigger than the NBA or the um, NFL in, in, in viewership. As, as I understand it. Well, I don't think you have to understand it if you've got a 13-year-old. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, the, the focus of, of the, the Cox family um, is very much around sustainability, uh, the environment, and being really good stewards uh, and advocates for, for the environment. Um, for example, they have made an investment in Bright Farms, Bright Farms is a hydroponic um, company uh, that grows fresh fruit and vegetables in an enclosed space using a lot less water and also they're, um, they're to be located near, um, near major cities so you don't have the transport. You don't have to ship things from California over to, to, to the East Coast. So... Um, very, very, very mindful of the, the sustainability side of things. Um, what else can I think of that they're getting into? Getting into healthcare uh, and uh, how they can sort of improve the healthcare side of things as well. So I, I think that they're willing to invest in future ideas. Um, they're willing to wait the long term to see if it actually... Uh, you know, it, it germinates into into something bigger, um, which I think is a, a unique um, attribute of a private company rather than a public company that obviously is pressured every quarter to announce another acquisition or announce increase in share price or earnings or dividends or whatever it might be. Angus, can I just go back to the issue of intellectual property mm -hmm. and uh, data privacy uh, and, and really the trend towards digitalization mm -hmm. of so many of the products that Cox is now providing. Yep. And I wondered whether you're now finding that you need more IP lawyers, uh, not only for to ensure that the contract is properly papered, but also for enforcement. Do you have much 
Uh, do you have a lot of challenges where you come up with a great idea, you develop the great idea, and then somebody pops up and says, oh, I happen to have the same idea? We've, um, we've been relatively lucky, I think, in the time that I've been here um, to not have major challenges in relation to that. You're, we have one, occasionally those issues. Uh, but one of the things that I did when I came in and we, we reorganised the team a bit, um, I had one lawyer uh, over in California who was very focused on Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book. Uh, her skill set really lends itself to marketing and, um, and IP. So I, I reshaped her position into really being in charge of uh, marketing and IP. I, um, I also recognised that there was more marketing and IP work that, than could go around. So we recruited younger lawyers in. So again, when I came in, I, I realised that there was a lot of 10, 15, 20 year uh, qualified lawyers. We didn't have any anyone really. We had one maybe between zero and 10 years. So uh, I recruited a new marketing and IP lawyer. We, um, another person to support supply chain, which is a very big area, a very busy. Um, another lawyer to work with the, uh, the the first lawyer on the Mannheim auctions. Um, we also, I recruited a new m and lawyer and I recruited a, uh, a new chief compliance officer and, uh, and a legal operations person. So reorganising the team but also putting, the, putting uh, extra resources against uh, privacy, um, especially with uh, CCPA coming up, uh, GDPR obviously having been... Um, a, uh, a similar sort of uh, situation in the EU. We, um, I'm, we're lucky to have a really, really strong, young and, and now pretty well experienced privacy lawyer. Uh, I reshaped his title a little bit because he's been involved in so many of the cyber issues recently. Um, uh, like most companies, you are constantly being attacked and, uh, and it's just a matter of uh, uh, not if you'll have an issue, it's really when you have an issue and if you're prepared uh, well enough to to react uh, and re and recognise and actually work out whether you do have an issue or that whether whether it's a real issue or not and whether it rises to sort of a, a, a significant level. Um, as I think we've all seen, there's been so many data breaches out there and, um, and uh, varying levels of success as far as handling them. Do you have a comprehensive risk, internal risk management program where you seek to defer some of your liability exposures, particularly around things like cyber, into the commercial insurance markets? Cox is, like I think a lot of companies like Coca-Cola, uh, fairly uh, big on the, the self-insurance side of things. Um, so it really depends upon the level of the incident as to when um, the insurance kicks in and it's, it's sort of a ca captive insurance companies uh, within. So the, the, um, the company really sort of calculates, um, you know, um, whether it's worthwhile getting the insurance or not and, and in what areas. So Angus, do you ever get involved in litigation as a corporation? Yes, uh, we do um, and it varies from the very small matters um, and, and issues, um, bankruptcy matters, uh, you know, accidents, slips and falls um, at our physical locations, particularly we have 70 auctions around the US. So, uh, and it varies to, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, claims in relation to um, IP infringement or um, antitrust issues, for example. So, yes, um, thankfully we don't have a huge docket, um, but it, um, it certainly keeps uh, our litigators very busy managing the various things that come through. And do you have personal experience of mediation? No, I don't. Um, I, you know, I've, I suppose I've focused my career uh, more on uh, the commercial and the corporate side, uh, particularly a lot of it in the general counselling and the marketing advertising area. 
um, not really getting involved, especially with with Coca Cola. It was very segmented. You had a litigation department, you had an IP department, you had a marketing legal department. So everyone sort of played their roles. And once an issue got to a certain point, basically when the claim came through the door, you'd walk down the corridor and you'd uh, you, you, you'd brief the uh, the litigators, and then they would take it from there. And you'd be involved as and when you needed to be. So whether it's arbitration, mediation, or litigation, um, you know, my my experience is. Uh, not not as significant as I think probably some general counsels are. And on the rare occasions when you do have anything of significance which uh, comes across your desk, mm-hmm. uh, do you tend to get involved or do you tend to leave your litigation department to deal with the matter? No, it's I suppose um, with the big ticket uh, issues, definitely I'm involved. Um, and um, what uh, Cox uh, has created is uh, a litigation centre of excellence. And the litigation centre of excellence uh, supports any litigation for Cox Automotive, for Cox Communications and Cox Enterprises. So there, there is a couple of litigators, uh, exceptionally good litigators that we work with and we, we really work as a team. One of the biggest risks that any company faces is reputation, reputational risk. And I wondered whether that was something that you've had first-hand experience of having to address, whether it's f- through some social media issue, whether it's through cyber breach or or, or some some other matter. Is, is, is that something that you find comes across your desk given the exposure to all companies who have I, built? I think um, reputation uh, and, and brand and being known as a company for doing the right thing, it, it, it comes into and as a factor in almost everything that we do. Um, the Cox, at the end of the day, this is a family-owned and run company, so we are responsible and um, we are the guardians of the reputation of the Cox family. And so a lot of things, if they are at that of those sort of sort of issue, that's a major consideration for us. You know what what. What is in the best interests of, of the family? Now, Angus, what do you consider the top attributes are for somebody who might want to become a GC? Um, I think that um, I think that you really need to be pragmatic. You need to be commercial. Um, you need to have a really good mix of um, com- um, legal, technical legal skills, but you also have to have a really good mix of the soft skills. You need to be able to communicate with people. You need to be able to connect with people at all levels, from the chairman of the board down to the the person that comes in and dusts my office. Um, you need to treat them all equally and equally well. Uh, I think you need to be a really good people developer. I, I see my job as developing uh, the future lawyers and effectively hopefully putting myself out of a job one day when I can retire and there's, there's a, there is absolutely ready people to step right in and, and take that role. I think you need to be a strategic person um, and I think that you must have knowledge of the business and the deeper the knowledge of the business that you have, the better lawyer you're going to be and the better strategic advisor you can be for the business. Um, I've still got a long way to go here at Cox. Um, I was very comfortable after almost 20 years at Coca-Cola that I was pretty confident I knew what was happening in the business, even though I was still learning things every every day. I think that's probably been the biggest um, the biggest uh, challenge for me here is to really granularity, the granularity of the business. Um, so I, I like to get involved in some of the transactions and the litigation, and that really helps you get there. Um, I think you need to be flexible. I think you need to be adaptable, personable. I think you need to have a sense of humour. Um, I think you need to be, uh, we use the, the, uh, the, um, the saying here, a really good general athlete. And that's the way I, I, I see it. Um, I think you also have to be, you have to be able to embrace change because that's just going to be a constant. So Angus, apart from uh, starting out in southwest Australia, moving to Sydney, uh, going to Beijing, Tokyo, uh, at the States, back to London, and then back to the US. What other things do you think somebody should do if they want to become a GC? 
I think um, what the the thing that the way the approach that I have adopted is, I will never if an opportunity comes your way, I will never say no to it, because one opportunity has always tended to lead to the next opportunity, and even when you don't think you're learning something and it's not of much use or you don't you know you don't feel as though it was worthwhile i've found that i've been able to so for example when i was a very young lawyer and i was doing motor vehicle accidents insurance work and workers compensation and those sorts of things i can now draw back on those when i'm talking with the employment lawyers here or someone's been injured or i used to end up having to read a lot of medical reports so you understand the psyche of people sometimes. So I think um, every experience that you have is is something you can draw on in the future. So I've been very mindful to to um, grab every opportunity that I could I, I could find or make those opportunities. And that's the other thing. I think that you have to be in control of your own career. You cannot sit back and expect your manager or your boss or someone else to to manage your career for you you have to to make make your own way in life um, make things happen and and um, sometimes maybe make your own luck um, the other thing I I have always sort of um, uh, had as a, a guiding principle is really and and the general count the former general or the former, former general counsel, Jeff Kelly of the Coca-Cola company always used to say to me, he said, Angus, it's all about luck, timing and chemistry. And he said, if you, if all those three are in line, things will go well. But if one's missing, you know, things may not work out. And I, I've, always, I've always loved that and, and stuck with that. I think that's very true. When I was in a house, I uh, came across a number of really, truly exceptional lawyers in small firms who were really in the middle of nowhere. I know it sounds a little harsh, but they were amazing lawyers. Yep. But for whatever reason, the breaks hadn't fallen their way, yep. so they weren't sitting in the corner office. Yep. And equally, I came across a number of corner office partners uh, for whom they had simply worked at a large firm and things had gone their way yep. without them actually having done much to uh, promote that. Uh, and so I'm a great believer that we all need to be mindful in the legal profession that there is always an element of luck in how we will, uh, where we end up. But of course, as you say, uh, you can increase your chances of being lucky. Absolutely. Uh, I Absolutely. Think, I think it's an important thing to, to bear in mind. Absolutely. Angus, thank you very much for spending time with us uh, today talking about your role as GC uh, of Cox Automotive and uh, for answering all the questions. We really appreciate your time and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. Absolutely my pleasure. Very happy to. Thank you for your time. You've been listening to The Future of Resolution, the podcast. You can follow The Future of Resolution on Miles Mediation and Arbitration's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and subscribe, rate, or review this podcast. Join us soon for another interesting discussion. Thank you for listening.